Hey, can we uh, take a moment and welcome everyone joining us online today? Wherever you're watching from, we are so glad that you are with us today. And uh, before we get into the message, just want to let you know, on your way in, you should have received a, a flyer um, that lets you know about the dine-out happening tomorrow at Islands from 4 p.m. to close. You can go eat at Islands in downtown Burbank. 20% of your purchase um, is going to go towards Night to Shine, um, which we're super excited about. And if you have any questions about Night to Shine, specifically um, Adrian, who's been leading that event for us, um, will be in the Connect area after the service. And, uh, but just so you guys know, uh, we are at capacity um, as far as uh, the people that we get to welcome to our church uh, for Night to Shine. And so we're looking forward to it. It's going to be an incredible night. And uh, yeah. Uh, but we're continuing a series we launched last Sunday called Subtraction. And really the thought that we're wrestling with is what if the life that we want is not really about adding anything, but really you and I learning how and what to subtract. And last week specifically, we talked about um, how we can go from feeling overstimulated and unfulfilled to balanced and fulfilled. Right? And that the journey to that is about you and I learning um, how to live by design and not by default. Right? That if we don't start to prioritize our life, someone else will. And if you're taking notes, the title of our message for week two is Overwhelmed and Stuck. Overwhelmed and Stuck. Let me pray for us before we get into the message today. Jesus, we love you. We thank you for who you are. We thank you for what you've done and what you're doing. And God, we thank you for your word. Thank you that your word is a lamp into our feet, light into our path. I pray that's exactly what it would be for us today. Whether you're in the room or joining us online, if you would pray this with me, God, if you speak, I'll listen. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said, amen and amen. Um, of all the things we feel like we could or should do, uh, what takes priority and where do we start? All right, I remember when we were working for a church in South Florida, uh, I had the opportunity to meet a guy um, who, for whatever reason, just kind of invited us into his life. And he was a, a very successful businessman. By the time we met him, he was in his early 60s. And, uh, and he would invite uh, young professionals uh, over to his house for a Bible study. And, um, and there'd be about probably 25, 30 of us, and we have a moment of worship, and then um, he would just talk to us. He would share with us. And one of the things that always fascinated me was, uh, at first, when we got the invitation and we talked to us about what he was wanting to do at his house, I, I looked at him, and I was like, man, you're a businessman. Right? Why are you leading a Bible study for young professionals? And he said, well, I, I want to just share all the things that I've learned with them. And so a little bit about this guy is he grew up on a farm in Arkansas, never went to college, um, but has now grown uh, multiple multi-million dollar businesses over the course of his life. He tells the story about how his first business deal happened when he was 11 years old. He worked all summer and his friends were uh, buying bicycles. And so he worked all summer at a farm to get enough money. Uh, his friends thought to buy a bicycle. And he said, no, I had my eyes on the property that touched the farm that I worked at. And so it was after the summer I had my money, I went to the, the guy who owned that land. And I said, hey, here's what I have. Can you take this as a down payment? And I'll, I'll work every summer until I pay off that land. That was his first purchase. That was his first business deal. To this day, he still owns that piece of land. And, uh, but when we would get, gather at his house, he would share with us how he became successful in business, and he would always pull out the Bible. And we'd say, every business principle I've learned is in this book. But one of the more important things that I learned from our conversations, because um, Tess and I also got to spend a little bit of time with him in New York City, uh, was just that as he was building each of his businesses, he was fully devoted and focused solely on the one that he was building. Not the others that might have existed alongside of it, but he was just solely focused on the one that he was building. He didn't give any other time or attention to the ones that he had already built because he built them in a way where he no longer needed to be a part of it. And so he could fully devote himself to it. And I actually think some of that is true of life. And if you're taking notes, uh, here's our big idea today, right? Getting the most out of life is not about doing everything, but going big on the right things. 
And what I loved about this man was because he understood how to uh, prioritize which businesses he was giving his focus and his attention and his time to fully, it allowed him to not feel like he had to do everything, but he could go big on the right things. All right? I think many of us, we love the idea of simplifying our lives, but some of us, we just don't know what to let go of. And I wonder if we're asking the wrong question. All right, instead of asking, uh, what, what do I need to let go of? What do I need to give up? What if we ask, what is the most important thing to me right now? What needs to take priority for, for me right now during this season? And what's important to you right now is where the answer to three questions intersect. And I want to give you those three questions. The first question is this. What are you deeply inspired by? What are you deeply inspired by? Right? What is the thing that maybe for this season of life that you're in, no matter what time of day it is, you're going to wake up and you're going to want to do it. Doesn't matter how much work is going to go into it. It's just everything about it is inspiring you. It energizes you when you see it, experience it. What is the thing that you are deeply inspired by? The second question is, uh, how are you, or what are you particularly talented at, right? And, and I'm not asking, uh, important to clarify, I'm not asking what do you want to become talented at, <laughs> right? Because I could say, I want to be talented at golf. Am I talented at golf? No, all right? I'm saying, what are you particularly talented at right now? Like you can wake up and you can go do it and you will do it well and it is gonna work and it is gonna be beautiful. That's what we're asking, right? So what are you deeply inspired by? What are you particularly talented at? And the last question is, how might it possibly meet a need in the world? How might it meet a need in the world, right? And so the answer to these three questions, where those answers intersect is what is most important to you in this season of life. And can this change from season to season? Of course it can. Of course it can. But I want to give you an example of how this plays out, right? And I'm going to use my wife as an example. And um, that look on her face, don't worry, it's nothing bad. I think I'm going to get some points today. Um, but I still got a big hole to dig myself out of if you've been around for a while. Um, but one of the things that my wife is deeply inspired by is an amazing experience of hospitality. So when we go to a great restaurant and the food is great and the service is great and, and, and the drinks are great or whatever it is, the experience of hospitality is something that inspires her. Like she gets awakened and energizes when she experiences great hospitality. We were in Seattle the week of Christmas and we went to a coffee shop called Story, Storyville and we walked in and we ordered our drinks and, and it had a great vibe to it. Aesthetically, it was cool. And, uh, and then when they told us how much our drinks were, I was like, what in the world? <laughs> I was like, is there gold in, the, in these drinks? Her coffee was 10 bucks. I know, <laughs> right? So for two drinks, it was like $22. They charged me, listen to this. They charged me $1.25 for a splash of almond milk, right? <laughs> I said, if we ever come back to this place, I'm just going to have bubble guts the rest of the day because I'm not paying $1.25 for almond milk. Can't do it, right? You guys got whole milk, 2%, whatever it is, I'm taking that. I'm going to take the risk, right? But here's what captivated Tess and captivated me is we sit down and we're, we're drinking our drinks and, uh, and just kind of captivated by the space and how well it was put together, how thoughtful everything was. And you know, when you go to a coffee shop, usually they have like a container or a pitcher where you go get water yourself. Before we could ever even think to go get water, somebody had brought water to us. And I looked at Tess, I said, I've never experienced this at a coffee shop. This is different. And you could see the employees. Once that happened, we started to look and we just started to pay attention. They had employees that were essentially floating, just looking for something to, like, something to do, something that needed. Before you could even think to take something, they were right there. We dropped something. Somebody was right there to pick it up. You would have thought that you were at a Michelin star restaurant. It was a coffee shop. All right? but, but those kind of experiences inspire. She's deeply inspired by that. Right? What is she uh, particularly talented at? She's an amazing cook. Told you I'm getting some points today. Um, 
She's an amazing chef, right? Does that mean that I enjoy all the things that she puts together? No, I don't. Um, It doesn't mean that it's not great, right? It's just not my taste. But she's an incredible chef. But I think the thing that she's also gifted at is creating experiences for people to come and connect relationally over a meal, over drinks, over some type of hospitable experience. She is, she, she's super gifted at creating that kind of space. And the way she thinks through all the things, like it just all matters. All the details matter for her, right? So if, if we're having this type of food, she's like, these are the types of drinks that we also need to have. And, and this is the way the table needs to be set and all these things. She is super gifted at that, right? And, and what need is that meeting in the world? Community. Community, right? She, she's, she's done a couple one-off things where she's just hosted people at our house. And one of the things I told her jokingly, I was like, Tess, you know you're just stealing what Jesus did in the Bible. Right? Right? But it's, it's because what she's doing is really meeting a need that exists in the world. right? And so when the answer to those three questions intersect... That's what is most important to her. And what I can tell you is that in most seasons in her life, when these three things intersect for her, that is when she is not just surviving through life, but that is when she is thriving. And just because we now have uh, uh, the right questions to maybe ask ourselves to figure out what's most important to us at a given time, it doesn't mean that the questions are easy to answer. And that's what I think is part of the beauty of Nehemiah's story, right? Uh, Nehemiah's story is really, it doesn't just show us what he went big on, but it shows us a little bit of how he got to those decisions, right? Nehemiah, what we learned about him uh, last week was he felt as though he should be something, doing something more or different with his life. He wanted a, a, a greater sense of purpose and meaning, right? His current situation wasn't fulfilling to him. And then an opportunity presents itself to him and he's inspired by it. He thinks he might be talented at it and it will meet a need in the world. But it's a big decision because it would mean that he would have to rearrange his entire life, right? And, and we talked about this last week. Many of us, we want the different thing, but we don't want what comes with having to do what we have to do to get the different thing. Right? As soon as we hear, man, I had to rearrange my entire life and the way I eat, the way I saw things, we're like, yeah, that's, I can't do that. And so Nehemiah, it's a big decision for him. And so how does Nehemiah know that this is the right thing for him? What Nehemiah did was he took some intentional time away to reflect and really think about what his life is all about. Right? When was the last time you just paused? You took a little bit of intentional time to pause and to ask yourself and to ask God, what is my life really about right now? Or what do I want my life to be about right now? In this season where I'm at right now, God, what is the most important thing to me? What am I deeply inspired by? What am I gifted at? And how can it meet a need in the world? When was the last time? Right? Some of you are like, I'm just too busy. Right, but what Nehemiah knew, and if you're taking notes, you can write this down. Sometimes in order to focus, we need to escape. Sometimes in order to focus, we need to escape. Some of us, we need to escape our phone. I'm guilty of that. All right, some of us, we need to escape uh, uh, Netflix and the shows that we love to binge. All right, some of us need to escape our own family. And I don't mean that in a negative way. All right, I really don't, but like, it's okay to say, hey, you know what? I need to go get an hour. I need to go get two hours to just pause and reflect and think about where my life is at right now, what I'm passionate about, what I want to do moving forward, right? Some of us need to just escape from our routine, that we are so caught up in our routine that that we're not even thinking about why we're doing things. We're just doing them at this point, right? Sometimes in order to focus, we need to escape. And some of you are like, well, I'm just way too busy for that. Can I tell you, if you're too busy to think, you're too busy, period, and nothing will change. And the busier you are, the more reflection is needed in order to clarify what you might need to subtract. And here's a question we need to wrestle with. Are you in control of your schedule or is your schedule in control of you? Are you in control of your schedule or is your schedule in control of you? And if you aren't happy about the way you're living life, whose responsibility is it to change it? 
Right, but let's look at what Nehemiah, I think, models for us. Look at what Nehemiah chapter 2, verses 11 through 18. This is what it says. It says, I went to Jerusalem, and after staying there three days, I set out during the night with a few others. I had not told anyone what my God had put in my heart to do for Jerusalem. Hold on to that. There were no mounts with me except the one I was riding on. By night, I went out through the valley gate toward the jackal well and the dung gate, examining the walls of Jerusalem which had been broken down, and its gates, which had been destroyed by fire. Then I moved on toward the fountain gate and the king's pool, but there was not enough room for my mount to get through, so I went up the valley by night, examining the wall. Finally, I turned back and re-entered through the valley gate. The officials did not know where I had gone or what I was doing, because as yet I had said nothing to the Jews or the priests or nobles or officials or any others who would be doing the work. Hold on to that. Verse 17, it says, Then I said to them, You see the trouble we are in. Jerusalem lies in ruins, and its gates have been burned with fire. Come, let us rebuild the wall of Jerusalem, and we will no longer be in disgrace. I also told them about the gracious hand of my God on me and what the king had said to me. They replied, Let us start rebuilding. So they began this good work. So Nehemiah knows that in order to pursue this thing that might give him a greater sense of purpose or might bring more fulfillment to his life, He has to stop doing what he has been doing in order to go and make room for what he is passionate about doing now. And what I love about Nehemiah, and what I told you to hold on to was multiple times in that passage, it tells us that he hadn't told the people yet. I think there's so much wisdom in that, right? We we get so excited about God putting something in our heart that we don't ever give it enough time to settle in our soul. Right? How many of us love spoiling surprises? You can't hold on to a surprise. I'm that way. I'm that way, man. Tess can tell you, when I get Tess a gift, I'm like, Tess, just, just open it now. <laughs> we don't need to wait. Right? And I think sometimes we do the same thing with things that God's trying to put in heart, our heart and sell in our heart. And, and if we don't take the necessary time like Nehemiah did and just to hold on to it to himself, doesn't mean that he was never going to share it with those people because eventually he does, but he held on to it. And I think Him holding on to what God had put in his heart allowed it to really take the ground in his soul and in his heart that he would not waver from it. Sometimes when God speaks to us and we're so quick to tell other people, and what we don't realize we're doing is when we say it, we don't even have, we haven't even thought about, okay, what do I need to put in place in my life to make sure this happens? Right, and we start to uh, overpromise and underdeliver on something that God really wants us to do. I think there's so much wisdom in that. But how do we how do we do what Nehemiah models for us? Right? How how do we get to where Nehemiah got to about going big on the right thing, knowing what to maybe take away from his life in order to pursue the thing that he was passionate about, the thing that was most important to him? We want to encourage you this week to explore this method. That method is this: escape. Look, play, sleep, and select. Escape, look, play, sleep, and select. And very quickly, I just want to unpack each of these things super quick. The first thing is to escape. we got to set aside distraction-free time and distraction-free space to reflect on what inspires you, what you're talented at, and what needs uh, are needed in the world. And where these three things can enter sect, right? Nehemiah took time away with trusted advisors to explore the different possibilities around rebuilding this wall, leaving what he was doing to go rebuild the wall, right? Maybe for you, uh, it's just a yearly thing, right? You don't have enough space to go on a full-on retreat, even though some of you are like, man, I need a whole week. Can you give me a whole week? I can't get you a whole week, right? But what if you said, you know what, before the year ends or when the year starts, I'm going to try to find three hours, two or three hours, to just really sit and journal about what life has been about for me. What, what am I passionate about right now? What's inspiring me right now? How has God gifted me? How can this meet a need in the world? And God, would you help me to focus on and go do those things? You won't figure out and have that clarity unless you escape, right? Maybe it's, it's quarterly reflections for you, or maybe it's daily reflection for you. What would it look like to say, you know what, 10 minutes of every single day, I'm just going to take a step back and work through what these three questions are and just reflect and see how God might be speaking to me, right? Luke 5, 16, it tells us that Jesus often withdrew to lonely places and prayed, 
right? And if Jesus needed to escape, how much more do you and I need to escape? That's the son of God. And he understood that, man, you know what? As much as I love these people, I got to go get away. As much as I love my kids, I, I got to get away. And the parents said, amen. They're like, man, you just keep saying that. Do a whole message on that, right? The second thing is to look. Look, this is the process of investigating opportunities and really the process of becoming self-aware, right? It's important to look into what is most important to you at any given season of your life because uh, something, uh, something that you're looking at might actually be different once you get closer to it, right? How many of us have been in a situation where we looked at something from a distance and we were like, that's what I want, and then we got into it without really investigating it, looking at it, looking into it before we just said we're gonna do it, and we got into it and we we're like, oh my gosh, what did I just get myself into? Right? And so we got to look. We, it's okay to ask questions. Find people who are doing the thing that maybe you want to do. Talk to them about it. Ask questions. Find a coach, a mentor. Right? You got to look into it. 1 Thessalonians 5.21, it says this, but test everything. Hold fast to what is good. But test everything. Hold fast to what is good. Right? You could journal your experiences and observations. You could maybe volunteer on a trial basis or take a class, read up on the subject, ask to shadow someone. But we got to look into it before we fully commit to it. We see Nehemiah in those verses we read. How many times did it tell us him looking at different parts of the wall before he committed to the work? He's wanting to see, man, how much, how much work is this actually going to take before I commit to it? That's also where the wisdom of him not telling the people what he wanted to do is also wise. Because Nehemiah didn't want to over, over promise and under deliver. So he had to walk around the wall. He took a full assessment of what, what work needed to be done to rebuild it. The third thing is to play. This is anything we do simply for the joy of doing rather than a means to an end, right? All work and no play makes us worse at work. Play enables you and I to make unexpected connections. It lowers our stress and it increases execution. When I worked for a tech company in New York City, built into my work calendar, after two hours of work was a 20-minute thing in my calendar that said, stand up. And my director explained to me when I came on staff, he said, hey, that 20 minutes is for you to go and do something that brings you joy. Every two hours, pause, 20 minutes, do something that's going to bring you joy. And I'm looking at him like, so you mean every two hours, I get 20 minutes to do whatever I want to do, and you're paying me for it? He said, yeah. So I could go play ping pong, because we had a ping pong table in the office. He's like, yeah, for 20 minutes. I was like, wow. It's like, man, I don't know if I'm ever going back to working at a church. <laughs> Kidding. But can I tell you that that 20-minute break increased my productivity? That, man, I was, when I came back from those 20 minutes, I was ready to lock back in and get to work again. It's important for us to do things that bring us joy in the midst of our work. Ecclesiastes 8.15, it says this, so I recommend having fun because there's nothing better for people in this world than to eat, drink, and enjoy life. Life was not something that we're supposed to just survive through. We're supposed to thrive and enjoy life. That, they will, that way they will experience some happiness along with all the hard work God gives them under the sun. The fourth thing is sleep. All scientific research continues to tell us we need eight hours of sleep at night to be our best. And everyone is saying, hallelujah. Some of y'all are nudging your spouse. I told you I need eight hours. All right. There was a Harvard study that was done um, called uh, Sleep Deficit, the Performance Killer, and it was discovered that pulling an all-nighter or getting only four to five hours uh, of sleep for an entire week uh, was, it would cause the same impairment as someone having a blood alcohol level of 0.1%, which you can get arrested for uh, a DUI in the state of California. That pulling an all-nighter, only getting four to five hours of sleep a night for a whole week would cause the same impairment equal to having a blood alcohol level of 0.1%. And some of us think we can survive on little sleep. I used to be that way. Right? I used to say, you know what? I'll just sleep when I'm dead. There's so much I want to do. Terrible mentality to have, I know. 
And then you have kids, and it's like, oh, my gosh, Jesus, teach me to rest in you. I need more sleep, right? Because now our son's been doing this thing where he's waking up at, like, 530 in the morning for no reason. It's like, why? Why? And um, pray for us, please. <laughs> but Nehemiah, he realized that he couldn't do his day job and help rebuild the wall. He had to choose one or the other. Why did he have to choose one or the other? He had to choose one or the other so that he could keep the right amount of time he set aside for rest as that, right? Because here's what we do. We say, well, you know what? I can do this and that. And what you don't realize is every time you say yes to something, you're saying no to something. And Nehemiah understood that, right? Maybe for you, it's setting a bedtime for yourself. I know we're all adults in, in the room mostly, but like maybe it's setting a bedtime, saying, hey, you know what? Eight o'clock hits, I'm getting in bed. All right, eight o'clock might be a little early, but you know, trust me, when you have kids, you'll get in bed at seven o'clock, I'm telling you. But maybe it's setting a bedtime. Maybe it's just trying to figure out how do I get a better rhythm of sleep, All right? Maybe it's creating a wind down process, right? So no screens an hour before I go to bed. All these things to just help slow your mind down, right? Uh, Psalm 127 verse 2, it says this, it is useless for you to work so hard from early morning until late at night, anxiously working for food to eat, for God gives rest to his loved ones. What I talked about at the end of last year was, man, we got to learn how to differentiate between uh, this needs to happen right now or this can wait. And for many of us, when it comes to our work, that's what we have to figure out in order to get the rest that we actually need. Do I need to send this email right now? Do I need to put together this presentation right now or can I wait? All right? The last thing is to select as the worship team comes back to join me. You've got to pick a lane. Eventually, you've got to stop collecting data, asking questions, looking around, and decide that for this set amount of time, this is my focus. And you have to communicate, clearly communicate why this is your top priority and how to tell if you're making progress, that kind of accountability will help you, right? It's gonna help you. It's gonna be an added benefit to keep you on track, to stay focused on whatever it is that is most important to you because eventually you'll have to say no to some good, fun, interesting, lucrative things in order to keep saying yes to the thing that you have committed to. Nehemiah decided that rebuilding the wall was his number one priority. He made it clear to those around him so that they could hold him accountable. And you can make a choice, make it known, give your why, and be confident. Luke 4, chapter 4, verses 42 to 43, it says this, early the next morning, Jesus went out to an isolated place. The crowd searched everywhere for him. And when they finally found him, they begged him not to leave them. Look at what Jesus says. He says, I must preach the good news of the kingdom of God in, in other towns too, because that is why I was sent. Jesus knew that where these three questions intersected for him was going and preaching the good news to the ends of the earth. Do I think that Jesus would have loved to have stayed with those people? 100%. That's who he was. That was his nature. But he understood his focus. And he said, no, nah, as much as I love you guys, I know why I was sent to this place. And so can I invite you to stand? I want to pray for us. And, and then Deshaun and, and Tay are going to just take a moment to briefly sing over us. And as they do, I just want to invite you to just invite the Holy Spirit to speak to you. But Jesus, we love you. We thank you for who you are. We thank you for what you've done and what you're doing. And God, we pray. God, would you help us to do the things that we need to do in order to gain some clarity as to what is the most important thing for us to be focused on during this season of our life. It's not about trying to do everything, but it's about trying to go big on the right thing. And so Holy Spirit, we want to invite you in this moment as we take a moment to pause to just speak to us. Give us clarity, give us vision and direction and guidance. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Come on. Mi nombre es Alejandra López. 
Y yo me llamo Leonel López. Nosotros tenemos aproximadamente desde el 2019, pero comenzamos en el campus de Corona. A mí lo que más me gusta de Sao Gil es que no te juzgan, que puedes ser tú, que no tienes que aparentar nada, que puedes ir como tú vas vestido normalmente, puedes hablar como tú normalmente hablas y eventualmente Dios va haciendo los cambios, no la gente que está ahí. Yo creo que mi vida en South Hills, antes de South Hills, era muy superficial, pero todo como en una zona de confort. Yo creo que de tan vacía que se sentía mi vida, tan, tan oscuro que estaba como mi mundo en ese momento, simplemente no quería estar aquí. Um, y recuerdo que en un momento de debilidad yo pues estaba a punto de quitarme la vida. Cuando decidí meterme al Facebook a, a dejar mi nota de partida, al momento que yo hice pone un video de, de Pastor Adam Smith del Campus de Corona, en el que él está hablando de, de depresión y de cómo a veces Dios nos hace llegar a lo más bajo para que nosotros podamos buscar de él y como a través de, de esos momentos de debilidad nosotros podemos acercarnos a Dios. En mí no había, en ese momento no había ninguna duda de no hacerlo. Y regreso al mensaje y empiezo a, mensaje, a escribirlo de, nuevamente y vuelve a pasar. Entonces en ese momento yo dije, Señor, te escucho y mañana voy a South Dios. Y se acordó de que estaba South Hills en Riverside y era en español. Entonces ella va también primero, toma a lo mejor otro par de, de fines de semana para que ella me invite a mí. Bonito experimentar el, las bendiciones que Dios te da si tú le eres fiel. Cambiado mucho nuestro matrimonio mm -hmm. con nuestros hijos, el ejemplo que le estamos dando a nuestros hijos eh, eh, es increíble. Hoy estoy aquí. Gracias a South Hills, puedo utilizar mi testimonio para impactar a más personas. Puedo ayudar a más personas a, a Cristo. Uh, gracias a South Hills, tengo una familia incondicional. South Hills Church, I just want to take a moment and say thank you for watching our service online. Whether you're watching it for the first time or you're watching it again because you enjoyed the service so much from the weekend, I'd like to take a moment and dive into our giving. Every week we give people the opportunity to give back and give to the local church so that God can continue to bless your lives and bless your finances. Here at South Hills, we believe that everything comes from God. We believe that he's the one that chose us and brought us into this world, gave us our gifts and talents and abilities. And I just want you to know that when we give, we are giving back what God has already given to us. If you've ever seen any of our envelopes at a South Hills campus, you'll see on there that it says, every week at South Hills, your generosity is giving people the opportunity to live a better story. And there's a scripture on there in Matthew chapter 6, verse 21 that says, where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. So I want to encourage you today to click down below and set up your giving, whether it's for the first time or whether you're doing reoccurring giving. We have four ways to give here at South Hills. One, you can do it in person at any of our campuses through an envelope. Or two, you can actually text any amount that you would like to, to 84321. And the third way is to download our Church Center app. I encourage you to do this one because a Church Center app gives you opportunity to stay connected with our church and your campuses. It's a great tool and resource for you to know what's going on. And the fourth way to give is to give online. You can go to southhills.org slash give, and you can set up your giving there. Whether you're a guest of our church or whether you are a member of our church, whether you simply just like to watch our services, I encourage you to trust God with your finances so that he can bless and anoint your finances and you can be trusting God in this journey of living life to the fullest. I love you and thank you for watching our online service today.